friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa Stringworks Workshop with another edition of Shop Talk. Don't know when this one will air, so some of the things I say may or may not apply in this video, and you may have already seen them or heard them in another video because of our transitioning to a different software. Uh, things are just a little bit jumbled up in time frames at the moment. So the first thing I want to do is give you a little bit of an update or status, and that is uh, the new apprentice, uh, Caleb, has been here. Uh, today will be day four for him. I couldn't really be more pleased. I'm just so happy it's worked out. I'm just going to pat myself on the back and say I'm good at picking out people. <laughs> Uh, I actually did hire a lot of people for Bell, so I do have a lot of experience in doing that because I used to have, you know, up to 20 people working for me at a time at Bell. And uh, so, you know, you do get a knack for picking out people, I think. I used to get comments on along those lines of, you know, boy, you sure do have some nice people working for you, you know, that kind of thing. So, and I feel like that's the case here. I've got two of the finest people working for me, Melissa and Caleb. I uh, couldn't really be more happy. You know, Caleb, uh, for only on a, you know, being day four, I, you know, you, I already know it's going to work. You know, if he, if he sticks with it, I mean, you know, in other words, it's all up to him, of course, but It'll work if he decides it's going to work, you know, because he's good at doing what he's doing and uh, he takes direction really well and uh, it, it just won't be no time. In fact, I've already started him on a couple of customer instruments on some of the lighter type work and he's doing great. Just doing great. Okay, I'm going to try to stay off the rants on this one because, <laughs> because we have a lot to go through. The bad news is we do have a lot to go through, so it's still probably going to be fairly long. Okay, the first thing I got is uh, from Greg Lang, and he's the fellow that sent the Angel Polish, which is, as I mentioned, a very good product. I think it's uh, certainly very good uh, you know, to use uh, for cleaning your guitar as well as polishing your guitar. Look up Angel Polish on the web. He said uh, he wanted to offer a suggestion. He saw one of my videos where I was turning pegs down on my lathe. You know, I've done it on the lathe a lot. Um, I've also used a tool like this, and that was his suggestion that I get a tool like this. And it's basically, a, it's called a peg shaver. It's got a blade down here that cuts. You slide the peg in and you just start spinning it and it cuts it on a long taper. I do use this method quite a bit and it does match the uh, tapered reamer that I have, which does make the job simpler and easier for most people. Um, I also find sometimes though that this will tear the, the peg a little bit. The lathe typically doesn't because I'm using more of a file and sanding method there, so it usually makes the peg even a little bit smoother. The lathe method works for me too. I mean, I use both methods. It really kind of depends on the moment and what, what I'm seeing and what I'm doing. But generally speaking, I, you know, overall, I typically do use this. So thanks, Greg, for the suggestion. I appreciate it. He, oh, by the way, he did mention a uh, another source, which I haven't checked out. And I'll just mention the source because you all could, you know, benefit from this as well. And, you know, I always believe in spreading all this around and helping everybody. I really do. Um, I, I think we can all be our own best friends by promoting each other rather than pulling each other down. So it's called Metropolitan Music in Stowe, Vermont, it looks like. That's uh, where they're located. Their uh, web address is www.metmusic.com. So M-E-T and then music.com. So uh, check out their site, you know. Uh, you know, they may have all kinds of great products. He, he's saying you could get that there, and they have a lot of other things, and their prices are really good. So I know nothing about Met Music, but I will check them out as well. So thanks, Greg, for the uh, tip. The next one is from Paul Lucien. Uh, I'm, I'll spell it because I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. L-U-C-I-E-N. I really enjoy your videos. Uh, he says, I used to restore banjos. I'm retired. He says, I use lacquer sticks a lot to fix blemishes and nicks and cracks. Do luthiers use those today? Um, well, Paul, the, the truthful answer is probably. I, I, I don't know, honestly. That's the truthful answer. It seems like I tried to look into these once before and I don't honestly remember why. I 
didn't get some or go with them or whatever, it's just been a long time. And I know I did look into them one time, but I'll look into them again because maybe I missed something. He's referring to them as lacquer sticks. I really honestly don't know if that's the name of them or, you know, if anybody has a suggestion on that and you want to send it to me, feel free on the lacquer sticks. So thank you, Paul, for watching the videos and for the suggestion on the lacquer sticks. We'll look into it. My old buddy, uh, Richard uh, Reisner from down in Texas, he, uh, he's the one that sent me my, uh, I guess I would call it my grown-up toy. You know, it was in the form of a gauge and it was a 20 gauge, if you will. <laughs> you probably saw that in an earlier shop talk. So it, uh, very cool toy, let me tell you. And uh, I've already played with it a few times. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, he said he just made a comment and the comment was that he watched someone else and I'm not going to name the someone else because again, I don't want to put anybody down. He said he watched them do a, a D28 neck reset. He said he did almost no teaching. In fact, he was um, just trying to show people that he could do it, I think. And he said he used hide glue. He says, I have no idea why he used that because it looks like nasty stuff. He says, I think tight bind is better. Uh, he said he was good at his job, but he was just incredibly boring. He also adds on here that he likes the tour of my farm. He said he could get used to a place like that. Well, thank you, Richard, for all the nice compliments there and for uh, you know referring to this other information. Um, the only reason I read that mostly is because it brings up a few points I just want to talk on real quick. One of them is the teaching part of this. When I started these videos, Honestly, I'm not sure exactly why I started them. I, yeah, yeah, I guess that's, that's probably not true. I guess the reason I started them was I thought maybe it might bring in a little more business. Well, be careful what you wish for <laughs> on that end. <laughs> Truly, it's, it's, it's been unbelievable on that part. So that part worked. <laughs> the part I didn't expect was the part about the teaching, if you will. I didn't start this thinking that I was going to teach people how to do this, but that's kind of what it's turned into. And, um, you know, we had, I, I, you know, it's, it blows me away. When I tell you these numbers, it just blows me away. We had 10.9 million minutes of view time as of just like last week. It has since dropped. It's barely over 10 million now, but that's a lot. 10.9 million minutes of view time, just to put that in terms you can wrap your head around is uh, if you left your television on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you'd have to leave it on for like 20 years plus, more than 20 years, in order to equal that amount of view time that we're getting in just 28 days. Crazy. It's just nuts. It's gone in. It's just gone into the stratosphere on that part. Never expected that at all. Truly didn't. The continual comments about that is that it's the training part of it. And, you know, just one email after another, one comment after another. Thank you for showing me how to do X, Y, Z. Thank you for this and thank you for explaining and da, 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 da. The reason I wanted to even talk about the training part is because my new apprentice, Caleb, being in the shop. So if you're a trainer, listen to this because I truly believe this and, it, you know, maybe it'll help you as being a trainer or a teacher or whatever. And that is, it does almost no good, in my opinion, to tell someone, here's how you hold your chisel, here's how you cut, you push like this. That's like nothing. That doesn't do you hardly any good at all. You just know I'm supposed to hold it this way and I'm supposed to push this way. Okay, and you think, well, that's all you need to know. No, it's not. You need to know why you need to hold it this way. And you need to know why you push it this way versus doing a different thing. Okay, so Caleb's getting a lot of the why. <laughs> Probably way more than he ever bargained for. Because if you don't tell the why, you haven't told them anything. You seriously haven't. I know you can show on a video how you do it and, and make them very quick videos and go through and it makes it makes you look like a genius. But if you don't tell the why behind it, you didn't tell them anything. In my example of the chisel, okay, the why is if you turn the chisel over the other way and you push, you're going to chip out the wood. The other thing is you have to learn to go a certain direction in the wood because the grain is 
on an angle like this perhaps, and if you go under this grain, you're gonna lift it. If you go over the top of the grain, you're gonna cut the grain off and you won't be breaking it out. That's the why. You gotta tell them the why. On any kind of training, I don't care if you're talking about computers or you're talking about building a car or what, the why is the important part of your training. Off the soapbox. The hide glue comment on Richards also made me uh, think. You know, guys, I seriously, I just want to be very clear about this because people get real upset about this. I got no problem with hide glue whatsoever if that's the way you want to build your instruments. I truly don't. It's not a smart comment. It's not, I'm not, there's no read between the lines. There's nothing like that. I don't use it for a couple of reasons. And these are my reasons. They don't have to be your reasons. It is more complicated to use. That's number one. This is a production shop, and by the way, when I call it a production shop, some people get mad because they have in their head a production shop, meaning you're just pushing things through your shop. You don't care. No, that's not what a production shop is. If that's what you have in your head, in my opinion, you've got the wrong connotation in your head. A production shop means you have to produce. You have to put things out. You have to do the work. You can do it in that manner, or you can do it carefully. We do it carefully. We are a production shop. We have to get work through the shop. Our backlog is forever long anyway, and we'll never get through our backlog. So we have to produce. That's what production shop means to me. It just means you've got to get the work out. Hide glue is a much slower process for getting the work out, in my opinion, number one. Number two, in my opinion, it doesn't have the properties I'm looking for. Um, I mean, it does have a couple of them. It has a quick tack time and quick hold time and that kind of thing, and that part's good. I don't like the heat thing. It, it takes very little heat for, in my opinion, in some cases, for hide glue to turn loose. Other cases, it seems to take more heat. I don't know why that is. I don't know. I, I think the product is not as consistent as some people might think it is. But there's a ton of myths and ton of wives' tales associated to hide glue that make people think it walks on water. And trust me, it does not. In my opinion, more instruments come in my shop broken because of hide glue than any other reason. One of the myths in wives' tales is, is hide glue is very flexible, yet very strong. It's not flexible at all. It's almost exactly like glass once it dries. It just is brittle and breaks, and that's part of the reason. If it gets shocked, it breaks and the joint breaks, and now you've got to fix it. In the hot car, it turns loose faster. You know, and people leave instruments in hot cars. You know, so for my money, it's not worth building them with high glue. That's just me personally. Again, it's a good glue, it's a good instrument glue, et cetera, and so forth. But then there's just as many myths on the opposite side negatively about things like tight bond or even just Elmer's wood glue. Any good carpenter's wood glue is perfectly fine for building an instrument, in my opinion. The, the myths on that side, the negative of that is that they say it's not flexible or it's, uh, you know, it's too flexible or it's too soft or it's this or it's that. And the truth is, in a blind test, you, nobody's gonna be able to pick out whether it was built with hide glue or whether it was built with type on. And, and that's just a black and white fact. There's nobody's gonna be able to pick that out. The glue just holds the instrument together. It's not what creates the sound. And if you think it's what creates the sound, you've missed the boat, period. You've missed the boat. Enough said on that. The only other thing I say, because people get on me so hard about it, they just eat me up with, why don't you use hide glue? You don't know what you're doing, you know? And I just respond back to them politely, but, I, but to me, it's a fact. It's, 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 this is a black and white fact. Hide glue was the very best glue you could get for centuries. It was the very best glue you could get when Ox carts were the very best form of transportation we had on this earth. Well, transportation has improved, and so has glue technology. That's my final word on it. Okay, Richard, thank you so much for everything. Thanks for continuing to watch. Thank you for that wonderful present you sent me. And thanks for these questions, because I think they spark good, uh, hopefully, good answers. <laughs> I don't know about that part, but anyway. At least I said what I said, and I stand by it. The next one is from uh, Clyde. I'm looking for the last name here. I don't see it. It's just got his email address and his first name in 
Oh no, Clyde is in the email address, but the name is Mike Power. So this is from Mike Power, it looks like. He wanted to thank me for uh, my videos, of course, and he watches them and all that, and you know, he, he was very complimentary. And he just wanted to thank me for the tip I showed on the Carolina Rose guitar where I actually bent the tuner to fit that shape. And I've done that actually quite a few times in the past over the years for one reason or another, either on instruments I built, but also on other instruments. And so, you know, he, he just wanted to thank me for that idea because he used it on, a, uh, on an instrument he was working on and it fixed the problem. And so, great, I'm glad that helped you with that tip. You know, he inquired about possibility of me building him an instrument that he's gonna think on down the road. His comment, though, sparked, uh, you know, something I thought I'd mention to you. I'm probably going to be focusing on building mostly custom instruments from this point forward. And that, the reason is because I've got so many of those to build as well. So me personally, I'll probably be doing most of the custom building. Caleb will probably be doing most of the repairs and most of the setup. Now, you know, just so you understand, guys, he's just sitting, you know, 10 feet from me here. And I'm watching very closely what he's doing and helping a lot with what he's doing. It's almost the same as if I was doing it because of that. Um, it truly is. And and he's pretty darn good at what he's doing uh, for a, a guy as young as him with no experience. I mean, I, I seriously, I'm almost blown away. So everything's gonna pretty much be the same. Caleb is also learning the skill of operating the video camera. And while we're talking skill, let's, let's just talk, again, a little side rant here. There's four skill sets that you kind of have to have to be here and do what I do, if you will. Okay, skill set number one would be like repairing instruments. That's really totally different than building them. Skill set number two is setting up instruments. Completely different than building them. Skill set number three is building them. Skill set number four, which I just mentioned, is video work. And I'm not very good at skill set number four, but we're getting better and we're trying to improve that. At the very beginning, you'll see in my videos and, and places where I comment, look, my job is to build and repair instruments. It's not to make videos. Making the video is totally secondary. In a real true sense, that will always be secondary. No question about that. I'm not going to spend hours setting up cameras and setting up audio and all that. I'm just not going to do it, period. You couldn't talk me into it for a million dollars. Now, if there was a camera crew sitting here and they want to do all that, that's perfectly fine. I don't have a problem with that. But I'm not going to take the time to do all that. But having said that, we still are trying to improve the quality of our videos and what we're putting out but not spend tons of time doing it. So, just so you know, we are continually striving to improve skill set number four, because we're not that great at it, and but we're trying to get better. So thank you, Mike Power, for that uh, question. Thank you for watching, and um, glad that tip helped you with the tuning keys. This next picture, I'm sure Melissa just is going to insert a picture on the screen. You can't really see it here, but I'll just show you just to get an idea. It's the inside of a guitar, and it looks like a concert hall, and it kind of does. You know, I've seen this picture before on the internet, and this one was sent to me by Peter Rahill, who is a regular viewer. So, Peter, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure Melissa will insert that picture. Uh, it does look kind of like a concert hall, and, and, and if you see the irony there, the fact that it's, you know, a guitar and the inside of it looks like a concert hall. Pretty cool. The next um, comment comes from Joe O'Rourke. I'm not sure where Joe's located here, but uh, anyway, Joe asks, could you please put out a video on how to string an acoustic guitar? He says, I'm throwing away one set of strings after another and the stores are closed because of the pandemic, etc., and so forth. You know, Joe, I take a lot of things for granted and this would be one I've taken for granted, I have to admit. You know, I've shown how to put a string on here and there and pieces of it, but I've never really made a video that says, here's how you string up a guitar. We'll do that, Joe. Thanks for the idea. It's a good, it's a good idea, and I think it would help a lot of people. Uh, it's something that us musicians pretty much take for granted, but there's tons of new people out there that haven't got a clue. And I should have known that because of the way, <laughs> the way I see him strung up all the time. I see some pretty funny stuff if you... 
you'd be amazed at some of the things I see on occasion come through the shop. <laughs> shop. It's, it is kind of humorous sometimes. Uh, Melissa has a note here, and I'm assuming that there is a video from a, a, a Gary Jackson, and he just wanted to send a thank you. Um, as a matter of fact, he's from uh, Hatfield, I think it is, near London, England. And he's got a little short video clip that we're going to insert in here. And uh, it's, I think he's thanking us for sending him something. So, Gary, thank you, man, for watching. I appreciate it. I'm glad something helped you out there. I got a question from uh, Darren Johnston about how to remove the back on a uh, guitar or, or a ukulele or something. I, it doesn't matter what the instrument is, but it's basically how to remove a back. And he was especially concerned about the points where it connects there at the tail block and the neck block because there's extra glue there, of course. It's much thicker there. It's much harder to remove the back in those locations without breaking the back or, you know, would be the same way. Okay, so what I'm telling you is you need a tool that in and of itself is a contradiction in terms. It really is. You need a very, very stiff, kind of hard tool, if you will, yet it needs to be flexible. <laughs> it's kind of crazy to say that, but there are such properties in certain steels and you you kind of need that like a saw blade is it would be an example it's flexible but it's still very hard very stiff if you will a saw blade would be a good example of uh, something like that so what you need is you need a knife that has those kinds of properties and then you need to have that knife to be thinned way down um, another thing that would probably work uh, or that I do use is like a, a artist palette knife. Um, those are pretty stiff uh, steel and you can thin that down and work that into the crack. And then what you do is you heat that blade, you know, pretty hot up. You don't want to turn it blue because then you're changing the temper in it, but you want to get it pretty darn warm and you want to then slide it through that crack. You just have to be persistent, and it does take a considerable amount of force, but on the other hand, it's a feel thing. And if you push too hard, you're gonna break something. You could even cut yourself, you could hurt yourself, you could break the guitar. I mean, there's a million problems with this. Don't get me wrong, it ain't easy, but you just gotta be persistent and keep pushing. Caleb is already learning that lesson this week. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I, I, side, side little trip. Before I go on my side trip, I'll just say thank you, Darren, for the question, and I hope that helps you, uh, you and others out there about how to remove the back on a guitar. But the side trip here is <laughs> these little finger planes. <laughs> These little finger planes that you see me use all the time. You know, honestly, I, and I hope this doesn't come across like a brag, I can use these things in my sleep. I mean, I use them all the time, and they're just, to me, it's just, I don't even have to look. I can feel what I'm cutting. And I seriously can, I can be talking to you, looking at you, and just cutting away and just doing fine. I seriously can. I mean, it's that easy for me with these. <laughs> but I also think it's kind of a joke because people come in the shop all the time and they see me doing this, see? And I, and they go, oh, I like, man, that thing really cuts. And they just see the curl of wood coming off, see? I say, here, yeah, here, go ahead and try it. And they, and it, it's just like they hit a brick wall. They, it, it doesn't move, you know? You, it just stops. It doesn't move. It takes a lot of force and a lot of know-how to use this thing. It really does. I, I take it for granted because I've been doing it for so long. And especially if you try to do this in really curly hard maple. I mean, it's like, oh my gosh. But you know, it, again, it's just knowing how to do it. You know, I couldn't go down a, you know, a 90 foot ski ramp and, and do that, you know, but there's plenty of people that can, you know, it's just an acquired skill. That's all it is. And uh, Caleb is learning that lesson this week, I can tell you for sure, because he's had to use this already two or three times on, on things that he's working on. That's a little side trip there. I thought you might find that humorous. But seriously, it always looks so simple in the videos. And even myself, I'll look at the video and go, boy, I made that look easy. <laughs> <laughs> because on video, all everything looks easy on video, you know, but you ought to try pushing this little sucker. And the little one is 10 times easier to push than the big one. You know, I mean, like this thing is, this thing's like hardly pushing anything to me, but, and as little as this is, 
it's way harder to push this than it is to push that. So there you go. Okay, the next thing is from John Cook. John just, you know, th thanking me for the videos and that sort of thing. And then he says, uh, you've inspired me to buy two $30 turn of the century uh, parlor guitars that were in horrible condition. And he's uh, working them over and he's making it work for, for himself there. He's saying that I am making the fingerboards myself and he wanted to know how to thickness them in, in relationship to the bridge. Quickest, shortest answer I can give everyone is that when you put a straight edge right down your fretboard and you go back to your bridge, you know, you want to have a little clearance at your bridge. I would say roughly a sixteenth of an inch. That's roughly a millimeter and a half, something like that. I mean, that's just rough numbers. Something along that line. So, if you've got a half inch thick fretboard, let's just say, and I'm exaggerating, and you put the straight edge on there and you end up being, you know, uh, five eighths of an inch high above your uh, bridge, well then you're going to need to take that way down, you know. So you want to end up being roughly you know, about a sixteenth of an inch. Just that's the best I can tell you. So thank you for the question, John. Thank you for watching the videos. I appreciate it. He said, P.S. I just watched the fourth shop talk uh, and had a good laugh. He said, you see, I also jacked up my house and dug a full basement underneath it. Lucky for me, I had a 16 year old son who wanted a car. <laughs> well, when I did it, I had a little baby girl. <laughs> that was all I had. <laughs> so it was just me and a little baby girl and a wife and a shovel. And uh, don't get me wrong, I, at some point, once I got it opened up enough, I did get in there with a tractor a little bit and help get a bucket in there and, and sh dig some of it out. But it was a lot of digging, trust me. Trust me. And uh, that hard rock clay that dried out under a house for years, just exactly like a rock. And then to top that off, it was filled with rocks. Rocks as big as your hand or bigger. And, oh my gosh, just a mess to dig. <laughs> I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Well, Caleb's in the shop now, so if you hear something in the background, you know what that is. Got a note here from Don Powers. Don says, I uh, put the uh, saddle and the new strings you sent on yesterday, leveled the frets, and this cheap K-tone mandolin sounds much better. He said, I recorded the stain, sustain before the replacements. I had only six seconds of sustain. And he said, I have easily 17 seconds of sustain now. He said, I don't know if that's good or bad. Well, in my book, that's good. Uh, anytime you can get your instrument to vibrate better, which is what that deer antler saddle does. It doesn't lose the vibration in the wood uh, like the wood does. I mean, the... Um, that, that ebony wood, even though it's pretty good at transferring the sound through, and it is pretty good because it's about the hardest wood there is, um, you will lose more in that wood than you will in the bone. The bone will send the transfer right on down through much faster. So Don, thank you for that note. Well, our next uh, comment is from uh, Mike Meyer. And Mike sent us a suggestion, which I think is a good suggestion overall. I'm just not quite sure how I would go about implementing it at this point in time. Though I'm definitely going to keep this one in the back of my mind and may give it a try. In regarding that, some of the cracks that Mike has seen me try to get glue down in the cracks. Now, keep in mind the top of a guitar and the top and the back of a guitar typically is less than an eighth inch thick. It don't take too much to get glue in those cracks, to be honest, most of the time. Now, occasionally those cracks are so darn tight that you can't get, you know, wood glue down in them or whatever. In those cases, often I just use CA glue because the CA glue will go in there and seal it together and, you know, it'll suck down into anything pretty much. So that's kind of how I typically handle it. Um, you know, I can typically get the glue in there with, you know, if the crack is open, that's not a problem because you're just talking about a minimal thickness. But anyway, his idea was how about closing off the sound hole, putting a shop vac there, that would create a vacuum and suck the glue down through. The concept is good, but I'm, I'm pretty positive that if you seriously sealed it off and sealed off the sound hole and put a shop vac on there, that it would collapse the guitar. And some people would say, nah, there's no way. But truly, it probably would. The reason is because, um, I mean, if you really did seal it, don't get me wrong, uh, shop vacs are pretty powerful. Um, they will suck a vacuum pretty quickly. You know, you got to remember the top is pretty thin, the back's pretty thin. 
If it's really braced well, it might hold, but then again, on the other hand, it could possibly just bust it and suck it right down. Because the atmospheric pressure, if you really do create a, a real vacuum, the atmosphere is very heavy and it will just collapse it. What I was thinking of was, you know, if you could adapt to the idea where you could get the suction directly behind the crack or whatever, that would probably work. But then again, I'm thinking, do I, am I trying to fix a problem I don't really have? And for the most part, I don't really have that problem. I don't really have a, a significant problem getting glue down in the cracks of the top or the back. More where I might have the problem would be maybe, you know, in a neck joint or something like that where you're trying to get glue up in something deeper, you know. And even on those, uh, I've taken to figuring out other methods, sometimes drilling a hole through into a place using air pressure, you know, uh, different ways. There's, there's options there, uh, but this is not a bad idea. I mean, it's just, I, you know, I'm not sure I could implement that one. But uh, I do appreciate you, Mike, for watching the videos, and uh, thank you very much for uh, thinking about me. And, uh, you know, ideas are always welcome. I, you know, sometimes I use them, sometimes I just put them on the back burner, you know, and that one there is on the back burner for now, and it may come in handy one of these days. Okay, I got no chance of pronouncing this one. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's a French name. He was kind to me and he, he, he signed it Leo. So Leo, thank you for your comment. But uh, I'll try his name because I don't, uh, you know, I have no clue how to say this. Pierrette et Leo Bellilou. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Leo. I'm not even going to bother spelling it because it's so long, I'll, I'll just mess that up too. But uh, anyway, Leo's comment was he was thanking me for the videos, that type of thing, and he says he was very sad to hear that some readers' comments are negative and nasty comments on videos that I'm freely sharing. And, uh, you know, he says just ignore those rude and mean people, and, uh, you know, he just you know, giving me good advice, basically. And so I, I thank you, Leo, for that. And I appreciate your watching the videos. He said he, he liked the farm. And it was beautiful. So, Leo, I, uh, I appreciate the comments. I appreciate your sentiment in there. And uh, for the most part, I just want everybody... The reason I mainly read this was that I wanted everybody to know that I don't let the rude and negative comments bother me anymore. They don't go through my mind that any more than the positive comments. And I get gazillions of positive comments. I realize that that's what they are. They're comments. They go in one ear, kind of out the other ear. Obviously, I appreciate the positive comments way more. You know, I don't even talk about them all that much because I don't want it to look like it's, you know, just a big bragging session here. But uh, on the other hand, um, those negative comments, the only reason I ever do bring them up is so you guys know how I'm handling them. Especially the fact that nowadays, from this point forward, I'm just blocking those kinds of comments. Just got no time to deal with them anymore. I'm, I'm over it, <laughs> if, if you will. And it uh, looks like David Green sent me an email, and, and maybe Melissa will post the pictures on this one where he has fixed the neck on his guitar, and he was asking about going into some splining or uh, scarf joints. It's hard to tell from a picture. It may be strong enough just like it is. In the case of his, because of, I think he sent something else that made me think that maybe splines in this case might be better than a scarf joint in this case. Uh, it really depends on case by case basis and I can't say one's better than the other. In general, I like the scarf joint better because you're replacing most all of the wood and you're just replacing it with a new piece of wood in general. But in this case, I think maybe the, uh, the splines might be the way to go if you think you need it. He also made a comment and he just said he wanted to thank my wife for editing the videos. And in the past, she did edit some of the videos. As a matter of fact, one winter, she spent almost the whole winter editing videos and did a pretty good job. Uh, at least she got the front end of it off uh, for, of the work off of my back and I then would go in and do the fine editing, uh, which saved me a lot of time. But really, Melissa has taken over that job entirely and uh, Melissa's doing a great job. So thank you, Melissa. So thanks, David, for the comments and uh, the pictures and things. And I'm pretty sure Melissa will show that on the screen. Paul Taylor up in the St. Louis, Missouri area had an item he had put out on eBay. And then he had a second thought. He said he wondered if I would like the item. 
I got to be honest, the item was such a nice item and, and such a valuable item, in my opinion, that I, you know, I said, well, it, Paul, that would be nice, but I would never ask you to send me something like that. I said, that's really a nice item. And, you know, I think you should just go ahead and sell it on eBay and, and everything would be great. He sent it to me anyway. <laughs> so, Paul, thank you. I really appreciate this. This is really a nice gift. You know, I mean, calipers are calipers are calipers until you get into real calipers. <laughs> These are real calipers. This is a Mitotoyo. Mitotoyo is one of the, in my opinion, the top three brands. There's, there's three main brands of machinist tools. I mean, there's way more, don't get me wrong. There's all kinds of them. But there's kind of three real popular names, if you will, that you hear more than you hear the others. There's plenty of others out there, and, and I know people will <laughs> send me all kinds of hate mail if I say this this way. But the point is, uh, this is one of those three names you hear all the time. You hear uh, Brown and Sharp, you hear Starrett, and you hear Mitotoyo. And Mitotoyo is very, very good. They're, they move like glass. I mean, they're just smooth and silky. You know, they're just, you can just feel the difference instantly. And uh, this is a antique set, probably from the 60s or 70s. Melissa may have more information on the date on that. But anyway, these are a while back, so it's nice to have them. And they're in perfect, pristine shape. The, these kinds of uh, tools, people really take care of them because they're expensive. <laughs> if you go to buy that thing right there, that's going to set you back a dollar or two. And then some. So, Paul, I can't thank you enough. This one will be uh, used sparingly. I won't use it that often, but when I use it, uh, when I do need real high precision, these babies will be coming out and I will use these for sure. I've had uh, a couple of questions lately um, on just making a, a demonstration on how to smooth fret ends as well. You know, over time, Wood does shrink a little bit and, uh, you know, it, the fret ends can become exposed. It's not just the shrinkage either. Literally, you will wear the fretboard down over time. The frets don't wear as easily and the wood will wear and the frets will still be exposed. So, I mean, over time, one way or the other, those fret ends become exposed. And so you can feel those. So I've shown that on video before, but I'll probably make a special video just for that purpose. And uh, just like I'll make one on the stringing of an instrument. There was no name attached to that one offhand. Colin may have been the one that inspired me thinking about making that video. So Colin, once again, thank you. And then in one of my shop talks, and I don't remember which one, uh, I mentioned that uh, Mark uh, had sent me a note about the uh, direct coupled bridge and said he had never seen an Alvarez in my videos with a direct coupled bridge. Do I ever work on those? You know, that was the one I embarrassed myself and said, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a lot of terms for a lot of things, and people call them by different names. So sometimes I just don't know the terminology. But in this case, honestly, I don't know that I've actually worked on one of these. And that's what it is. And Melissa can possibly put a, a better picture on the screen. It's really a two-piece bridge, if you want to call it that. The bridge and the saddle are glued down to the top. There's a separate thing that has holes in it that the strings go down through. So thank you again, Mark, and uh, for that comment. And I didn't mention Mark's last name because I can't say it, but it's D-I-G-E-N-N-A-R-O. De Gennaro. De Gennaro, I imagine, is how you say that. So thank you, Mark. This next note is from Mike Griffin. He says, hey, Jerry, I met you last year at Mountain View, Arkansas. He says, I don't know if I mentioned it to you, but I do a lot of repairs in the Nashville area. He says, I watch a lot of the different luthiers on YouTube. And he mentioned Randy as an example, Randy Shardiger, and Woodford also. He said, I took your advice and I replaced the uh, cracked bridge plate on my uh, Alvarez with some Paduk. He says, normally I use maple. He says, but I tried the Paduke. He says, I have to say, I was really satisfied with the results. And the customer was as well. Matter of fact, he said the customer was ecstatic. He said there was a, an increase in volume and tone. So thank you for uh, that idea and about using that in the bridge plate. So Mike, glad that helped you. And I'm glad you tried that. Another soapbox, sorry. You know, there are some things, guys, that only make common sense to me. 
common sense. I mean, I, I don't think you have to really think these things through that much. If you just, if you just stop and think about it, where does an instrument vibrate? Right in the middle, mainly. That's, that's your main place it's going to vibrate. Why would you ever think to use something less than your best wood in that place? It's just common sense. People are going to argue with me on this because all of the violin family uses maple for their back and sides. And they're going to tell me that violin vibrates just fine. It does in those kinds of instruments for a different reason. You need to understand the technology. The technology is totally different on a violin than it is on a guitar. And why do I mean by that? On a, on a violin, you have a constant bowing action. That bow sends a continual vibration through the instrument. It's like, it's just a continual vibration. The pick is, bing, you got one vibration. Bing, you got another vibration. That's totally different technology. That continual vibration allows or makes that maple wood vibrate in that case. And in that case, the blending of the soft top with the maple does make a beautiful sound. Maple's not very resonant otherwise. It's just not. It's not a good tone wood. You can hold maple up and tap it and it kind of goes tonk. And that's about all you get out of it most of the time. Now, if you carve it properly, you'll get more than that. And, and any violin maker that knows what they're doing will get a good tone out of the back of a piece of maple. But it's still not the same tone that you will get if you put up a different, better resonating hardwood. You'll get much more tone. So that's my whole point. Just common sense, understanding the technology with common sense will tell you that you need a better wood in your bridge plate area. Period. The next email is from uh, Wes Olson. And he was very complimentary about the videos. And he said he, him and his wife both watch the videos. Well, thank you, Mrs. Olson, too, for watching the videos. I appreciate it. He says he likes the way I talk through the troubleshooting processes and let us, you know, let the viewers know what I'm thinking. And I get that comment quite a bit. Yeah, I know I can speed through most all of that stuff and uh, just put out a quick video. But then, you know, as I mentioned early in this video, people are really using this for training a lot. So that's why I do it. I know it can be boring and, you know, and, and it can be repetitive. I repeat the same things a number of times sometimes. But, you know, it is what it is. And I thank you, uh, Wes, for uh, appreciating that. Uh, thank you for watching on that. Got a question. The question is, have I ever had an allergic reaction or a negative reaction in general from any of the woods that I've worked with? Not really, no. I will tell you the Paduke is one of the closest things that I've had. Paduke is not good to breathe in, I can tell you for sure. No wood dust is good to breathe in. It's just not, period, zero, none of it is. But the exotic woods are worse. Rosewood's another example. Paduke is pretty bad though. Uh, you know, if you breathe in a little bit of Paduke, uh, you can kind of feel it. I've not actually had a re reaction and that's kind of surprising because I'm very allergic to a lot of things. Uh, my daughter is super, super allergic. She gets shots every week. Uh, you know, just because she's just so highly allergic to everything. So uh, that's another one of those genetic defects I've passed down. I am very allergic, but mostly my aller allergies affect my sinuses. I can never breathe through my nose, which I might as well just say, as you've just heard me gasp, I have to breathe through my mouth. And when I'm talking, it's hard to breathe. So that's why you hear me gasp all the time. I just can't breathe through my nose. In that regard, that may be part of this wood allergy thing. But other than that, no, I've never really had a, a, a negative reaction. But I will caution everyone out there that some of those exotics can really be very bad. And if you're gonna, you know, you need to open up the doors or whatever, if you're really gonna be doing a lot that's gonna stir up the dust. We do have a pretty darn good vacuum system here. I put out a video on how I rebuilt all the vacuum gates. That improved that system tremendously. I stand by those things. If you need a vacuum system in your shop, for my money, I wouldn't buy those commercially made vacuum gates unless you buy the really expensive ones. They may work fine. I don't know. I've never bought the really expensive ones. I bought the cheap ones and they don't work worth a darn. Just make yourself some like that. Check out my video on that and uh, you'll be way ahead and uh, be a lot safer too. So thank you Wes for the question, um, but fortunately I've not had that problem. 
Eureka Baradas. Mm. Don't know how to say that exactly. E U R I C O B A R R A D S. Uh, I could think of a lot of ways to pronounce that. B Baradas. Baradas. So there's, uh, anyway, uh, Yuriko, I appreciate you sending us a beautiful picture. A lot of people send us pictures of guitars with roses on them, uh, possibly for future inspiration. And uh, that's a beautiful picture, a beautiful guitar. So thank you for sending that. I'm sure Melissa will put that picture up on the screen as well. Melissa gave me a note and said, uh, give a shout out to Mr. Jim Walter and uh, of Lake Charles, Louisiana. Uh, Jim is thinking about making a, uh, trip up here one of these days. So Jim, thank you for watching the videos. If you do make it up here, we'll show you around the shop, give you a grand tour. The uh, next one is from Russell Brown and Russell says, uh, just a note to say how much I enjoy your videos. Since, since the Corona lockdown, I have watched a lot of them. You know, I get that a lot lately too. And I think that part of the reason our uh, view minutes was up uh, is, is because of that, of course. He says, thanks for your effort putting them all together. I like your style. Well, Russ, thank you. I like your style too. Thank you for uh, watching the videos. I appreciate it very much. The last one, thunderous applause. <laughs> Michael Wilson, who is a uh, presently a customer. We have a, a couple of his instruments in the shop at the moment. He's asking a question. He said, there is a significant disagreement online uh, forums about radius tops and backs. Do you radius yours? And if so, how much? Well, let me just back up the truck here and, and give you a different perspective on it entirely. No, I don't radius mine. Why? I don't know. I just build flat top guitars, you know. If you like a radius or if you like a flat top, then that's what you should build. You know, I don't have it. I don't see an argument there at all myself. Which do I think is better? I don't know that I have a real opinion on that. I mean, it's kind of like uh, which car's better. You know, it's it's kind of just personal preference, and that's probably where I'll leave this. I'll just add a couple of little notes. I like the flat top sound. I think the flat top probably vibrates a little bit better. I mean, it just kind of stands to reason the arch top won't quite be as uh, vibrational because it's got a little more structure there that's, that's kind of stiffening the top, if you will. Not a big deal. I mean, like, you know, uh, arch top guitars that are hand carved, they don't sound like flat top guitars at all. They've got a, a little bit more metallic sound because they're arch topped and they don't vibrate the same way that a flat top vibrate. End of discussion. I mean, you know, that's just pretty much factual. Uh, you can argue that if you want to, but that's pretty much factual. I just like flat top guitars, so that's what I build. I, I don't think I would get in the middle of that argument there because to me, it's just total personal preference. Hope that helps you, Michael. Sorry for the cop out on the answer. Thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoyed this episode of Shop Talk. Tell your friends.